The ocean does not keep secrets. It swallows them whole. On December 4th, 1872, in the heart of the vast, unforgiving Atlantic, the crew of the Canadian brigantine De Gratia spotted a ship. It was drifting aimlessly. Its sails were set, yet it moved with an unnatural, drunken gait, a puppet whose strings had been cut. This was no derelict. From a distance, she looked seaworthy, if a little battered by the weather. But as the De Gratia drew closer, a profound silence seemed to radiate from her decks. There were no sailors on watch, no helmsman at the wheel, no answer to their hails. It was a silent wanderer, a ghost ship sailing on an empty sea. Her name, painted on the stern, would become a legend, a byword for the inexplicable, the Mary Celeste. When the boarding party from the De Gratia set foot on her deck, the chill they felt was not from the sea spray. The ship was utterly, completely empty. But this was not a scene of chaos. It was a scene of departure. A hurried yet strangely orderly departure into nothingness. The greatest maritime mystery of all time had just begun and its central, haunting question echoed across the silent deck. Where was the crew? Every tragedy begins with a day like any other. For the Mary Celeste, it was November 7th, 1872. She departed from New York, bound for Genoa, Italy. Her hull was filled with over 1,700 barrels of raw industrial grid alcohol. A routine cargo for a routine voyage. Her captain was a man of impeccable character. 37-year-old Benjamin Spooner Brains, a devout Christian, a teetotaler, and a highly experienced seaman who owned a share in the ship he commanded. He was not a man given to panic or rash decisions. And this voyage was special. He was not alone. With him was his wife of 10 years, Sarah Elizabeth Reigns, and their two-year-old daughter, Sophia Matilda. Imagine Sarah setting up a small domestic world within the creaking timbers of the ship. A sewing machine in her cabin her daughter's toys carefully stowed. For them, this was not just a commercial venture. It was a family adventure. The vast ocean was to be their home for the next few weeks. The crew of seven were all seasoned sailors, mostly Germans, capable men, and that. There was no hint of discord, no premonition of doom. The ship's logbook, later found, spoke of calm seas and good progress. It was a picture of perfect, hopeful normalcy. A family and their crew, sailing towards a bright Italian horizon. They were not just names on a manifest. They were hearts beating with life, with plans, with futures futures that would dissolve somewhere in the lonely expanse between the Azores and Portugal. The boarding party picked their way through the ship, their footsteps echoing in the unnatural quiet. What they found only deepened the mystery. The ship was wet, with a few feet of water in the hold, but she was entirely seaworthy. Her sails were partially set, though some were torn. 
The ship's clock was not working. The compass on the pinnacle was destroyed. But inside the cabins, it was as if the crew had simply vanished mid-breath. Captain Briggs's cabin was tidy. His wife's personal effects, her jewelry, were untouched. On a small table, her sewing machine sat with a piece of needlework still in it, as if she had just stepped away for a moment. Little Sophia's toys were in their place. In the gallery, there was food and ample water. The crew's sea chests were in their quarters, their money and tobacco pipes left behind. Robbery? Piracy? That made no sense. Why would pirates take the people and leave the valuables? The cargo of alcohol was almost entirely intact, save for nine barrels found empty. The ship's sextant and chronometer, essential navigational tools, were gone. And crucially, the ship's single lifeboat was missing. Not torn away by a storm, but seemingly launched deliberately. The final entry in the ship's log was dated November 25th ten days before she was found. It noted the ship's position and simply read, at five o'clock. The entry recorded nothing unusual. No storm, no attack, no panic. After that, nothing. A ten-day gap in time, filled only with silence. It was a perfectly preserved tomb floating on the waves. A home abandoned in an instant. Humanity abhors a vacuum. And in the vacuum of knowledge left by the Mary Celeste, theories bloomed like algae on a stagnant pond. The first, and ugliest, was foul play. The Attorney General of Gibraltar, who presided over the salvage hearings, was convinced of it. He suspected mutiny, that the crew had murdered the Briggs family and fled in the lifeboat. There were no signs of a struggle, no bloodstains, nothing to suggest the violent end he imagined. Others whispered of pirates. But what pirates leave behind a valuable cargo and a perfectly good ship? The fantastic theories followed. Abduction by aliens, an attack by a giant squid or sea monster. But the most compelling theories lie not in fantasy, but in a terrifying combination of chemistry and fear. Remember the cargo, 1,700 barrels of raw alcohol. Nine of those barrels were made of the more porous red oak, while the rest were sturdy white oak. It's possible that some alcohol vapors leaked from these nine barrels and built up in the hold. Perhaps a change in atmospheric pressure or the sound of a low-grade, rumbling, vapor explosion occurred. There was no fire, but the sound alone, a violent whoosh from the hold, might have been enough. In that moment of pure terror, Captain Briggs, a cautious family man, may have made a fatal decision. Fearing an imminent catastrophic explosion, he orders everyone to abandon ship temporarily. They launch the lifeboat, tethering it to the Mary Celeste with a long rope, intending to wait at a safe distance until the danger passes. They pile in, 
the captain and his wife holding their daughter, the seven crewmen. They wake. The wind picks up. The tow line, frayed by the strain, snaps. There they are. Ten souls in a tiny open boat, watching in horror as their ship, their only salvation, sails silently away from them, catching the wind and disappearing over the horizon, left to the mercy of the vast, indifferent Atlantic. It is a theory that fits the facts. The missing lifeboat, the abandoned ship, the impact cargo. It is logical, it is plausible, and it is absolutely heartbreaking. The Mary Celeste sailed on for a few more years under different owners, a cursed vessel that no sailor truly trusted. She was eventually deliberately run aground in Haiti in an insurance fraud scheme. A sad end for a ship of such legend. But the ship was only ever a vessel for the true mystery, the Ten Lost Souls. Captain Briggs, his wife Sarah, the little girl Sophia, and the seven men of their crew. They were never found. No wreckage of the lifeboat, no bodies, no final message in a bottle. They were simply erased by the sea. The story of the Mary Celeste endures not just because it is an unsolved puzzle, but because it touches upon our most primal fears. The fear of the unknown, the fear of being lost, the fear that in one terrible, unforeseen moment, our entire world can be swept away, leaving behind only a silent, empty space. She drifts on in our collective memory, a perfect ship with no crew, a ghost story written on water, a haunting, eternal reminder that for all our maps and all our compasses, the ocean always has the final silent word.